So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Medial. I recognize most of you. But I'm actually really pleased to see a number of faces in the audience of people I don't know. Out of curiosity, how many of you in the room have never heard me give a talk before? Wow. Wow. That's really cool on one hand, a little scary in another. Um, it makes some of what I'm going to talk about today probably um, really good for me to spend some time talking about. As long as I'm asking questions, a couple of others. Um, how many of you have joined the Debian project or community, whatever you think your most significant sort of threshold was like in the last couple of years? If I couple? Two. <laughs> <laughs> you don't count, you know. Uh, the last five? <laughs> Ten? Fifteen? Since the fall of 1994? <laughs> Just had to ask. Out of curiosity, how many of you were born since the fall of 1994? <laughs> and are willing to admit it in public? <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, there's at least one person in the room that's been working, that, who's been alive less long than I've been working on Debian, which is kind of amusing. Um, at least to me. So, what's the point of talking about the early history of Debian? The simple answer would be, I don't know, I was asked to do it. Um, <coughs> but um, more honestly, um, as I step through the things that I think are important to talk about um, regarding the early history of this project, I hope it becomes apparent that part of what's important is that we all sort of understand deeply and intrinsically what makes Debian interesting and different and special and why we should care about it. And that's all sort of tied up in this notion of the project having a set of common core values and sort of committing to each other to live by and work by and collaborate under that shared uh, set of core values. And one of the ways we can do that is to make sure that we understand sort of where we came from, what the original motivations for the project were, uh, how we ended up with some of the uh, procedures and processes and foundational documents that we have, what motivated those, what caused us to have the flavor in those documents that we ended up with. And so what I hope that we can do today is, is <clears throat> let me traipse through a little bit of early history, give you what I think were some important milestones, and in the process talk a little bit about um, how I came personally to be involved with the project. And then I guess in the sort of popular way of putting it these days, we'll switch into ask me anything mode. And I'll be happy to answer questions as long as we have time. And I believe, if I read things correctly, that they've scheduled this for an hour and 45. So even with my tendency to give long-winded answers, uh, there's probably a chance for us to get quite a bit of stuff. Since not everybody uh, has heard me talk before, let me start with just a brief, who the heck is this PDL guy? I mean, some of you can laugh. Any of you have known me, you know, for as long as you've been involved in Debian. But um, I tell people, quite seriously, I made my first contribution to what we later started calling free software in 1979. It was a piece of um, assembly language code for a then obscure and now almost completely forgotten uh, microprocessor architecture. Um, it's a long story. <coughs> I, as a consequence of that contribution, I was invited to attend a users group meeting in Canada. Um, but I wasn't old enough to drive yet, much less travel independently to another country uh, to hang out with a bunch of computer people. Um, this was the point in history when my grandfather, who'd been a machinist and uh, a welder and all that sort of thing, decided that an important thing for me to do one summer when I was staying with them for a couple of weeks was to learn how to weld. In case this computer thing didn't turn out to be real, I'd at least have a skill. So, you know, this was, this was a long time ago. Um, I started digging. It turns out I first discovered Debian in 1994, but my first personal actual contribution to the project was in about October of 1995. How do I know this? I've spent several evenings in the last week spelunking ancient backups, looking at emails I didn't think I still had. <laughs> and to my great sorrow, I have not yet discovered the two that I think are the most interesting and most important 
Um, when uh, Bruce Parents introduced me to Ian Murdoch and he thanked me for joining the project, uh, that's what the new maintainer process for me was like. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, very shortly after officially becoming part of the project, I got very involved and did a lot of things. And over the time, I served as deputy project leader for a year, as tech community chair for a long time. Might have been involved in a decision or two while that period was going on. <coughs> um, and then, you know, other things around the project. Uh, those of you who attended the SPI BOF yesterday uh, will have heard that I served on the board of directors of Software in the Public Interest for about 12 years and for the last 10 as its president. I stepped down about a year ago, and I'm really pleased that uh, other folks have picked up and are carrying on well there. SPI is the organization that provides legal and financial existence for the Debian project in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and then <coughs> one of the things that I guess I'm probably best known for is that I also worked for a really long time for HP, uh, the part of Hewlett Packard that became HPE. And the interesting thing is, no, I'm not the guy who talked HP into doing things with Debian. Um, the moment HP decided it wanted to do things with Debian, they decided having me around was maybe not such a bad idea. Um, but over the course of almost 30 years at HP and what became HPE um, in two separate stints, um, I had the opportunity for a number of years to serve as the chief technologist, sort of the CTO for the open source Linux business. And then when I went back, I went back in as an HPE fellow in the office of the CTO for about 25 months. But since the end of September last year, I am now thoroughly enjoying early retirement 2.0. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, patches accepted. Um, <laughs> and we'll see how things go. Um, in terms of things I'm doing now, um, probably most relevant to many of you in this room, I recently, as in about six months ago, joined the Evaluations Committee at the Software Freedom Conservancy. And uh, it's really cool because here's another fiscal sponsorship organization that in some ways does a lot of what SPI does, but in a very different way with a different relationship with its projects. And so it's actually kind of fun for me to be looking at um, a bunch of uh, potential of free software projects that want to associate with the conservancy and having a different set of selection cri criteria that need to be considered. Um, I'm also on the board of directors of Aleph Objects, which is the parent of Lulzbot, um, 3D printer maker. I'm very proud to be in that position because they were the first company to achieve the Free Software Foundation's Respects for Freedom brand for all of their hardware um, and their business practices. And, you know, of all the for-profit companies I could be on the board of, that's a pretty cool one to be associated with. And if you want a 3D printer, you can't find a better kit. Okay, so as I said, I want to talk a little bit about what attracted me to Debian. A few key moments that I think are important in the early project history. And then, whatever you want to hear about. Uh, I, as you can tell, I've been around this project for a very long time. Um, as you'll see from some of the moments that I think are interesting, uh, particularly some of the ones that I was personally sort of more involved with than others, there are a lot of things we could talk about. That requires a caveat though. What I'm gonna talk about is the history of the project as seen from where I was standing and where I was sitting and what I was thinking about. Uh, when this talk session was originally proposed, uh, Ian Jackson was also part of the invitee list, and I would have loved to have tag-teamed this with somebody like Ian. Uh, unfortunately, circumstances caused him to be somewhere other than DevConf right now, uh, which, you know, is cool for him and not so great for me, but um, we'll carry on, and I just want to make sure you understand that as we go through, I'm not trying to make this be all the cool things Bdale did for Debian, but it's impossible for me to not mention a few of the things I think were important that I had something to do with in the process of talking about this. So, I know many of you would be disappointed if I didn't throw a gratuitous rocket photo or two in. Um, and the interesting thing is, the way I found my way to Debian isn't actually through rockets. Um, that's something that came after I was playing with Debian. Um, it was something sort of rocket related though. I was working on an amateur radio satellite project. Um, and so what happened is, um, I was working on with a number of other people. By the way, this is a slide that I cut from a presentation deck I used in 2003. Um, 
This was done in Magic Point. I don't know if anybody remembers Magic Point. Oh, what a hideously horrible system. But uh, for a while, I had a Debian template, and I used it for all my presentations, including the corporate ones. Got me lots of certain kinds of attention. Um, so anyway, I was working on a GPS receiver. This is before GPS was real. But it, the GPS system was being built. And we were going to fly a GPS receiver on a satellite and see what we could learn about on-orbit use of GPS for navigation. And the problem was that we needed a development platform. And I, at that time, was a user of BSDI, which was a commercial derivative of Berkeley Unix that I was running on a PC at my house. And the problem was nobody else working on that project could afford a BSDI license. It was 1000 bucks or something, which in the annals of Unix history had seemed pretty cheap to me. But um, in sort of the context of people in Eastern European countries who were contributing to the project, that was a hell of a lot of money. And so what I discovered after a while is that every time I built a new cross-compiler tool chain for the AMD 29000 series processor we were using for that project, um, I would make these copious notes and create a notebook file of exactly what commands I had issued in what order to build, successfully build a GCC cross-compilation suite. And I would make that file part of this monstrous tarball of all the binaries and such that I had built on my BSDI system that I made available for download over a modem at you know, dial-up speeds. <coughs> and people in Europe were downloading that entire tarball just to get that one file that had my recipe. And then they were replicating uh, that recipe on Linux machines. And I had heard about Linux, I knew about Linux, but that's when all of a sudden it's like, ah, I'm doing the wrong thing. If I want to collaborate with these people, I should figure out how to use the same stuff they were using. Um, and somewhere in that same time frame, Bruce Perrins had this great idea of creating a Linux distribution for ham radio people. And he had started a project called Linux for Hams. It's one of those lovely virtual product projects that you know, involved a, a description and never had any deliverables that I'm aware of. Um, <coughs> because Bruce went looking around to see what to start with, and he discovered Debian. And he thought, oh, yeah, this is cool. We should start with Debian and put some ham radio software on top of it. And so when I knew that he was working on this thing for Linux called Linux for Hams, I poked him and said, hey, Bruce, um, I'm working on this AMSAT project. Um, what about this Linux for Hams thing? And he sent me some emails suggesting I go grab these bits from this thing called Debian and see if I could make it work on some hardware that I have. Um, not surprisingly, within a couple of days of stumbling my way through an installation, which was before boot floppies really existed, um, <coughs> I realized that there were a couple of little utilities that I thought were really important that weren't part of the system. And so what did I do? Well, one of them was really simple. Watch the thing that would tail, you know, a command's output and sort of redisplay it on the screen. And I wrote one of those from scratch and offered it to the project. And Bruce sent this message to Ian saying, this is kind of cool, we should take this. And Ian sent a note back saying, cool, upload it. <coughs> it's not quite that simple, but very close to that simple. And boom, I was contributing to Debian. So over the year, I've, I've done a lot of things. Um, yeah, so you can say more recently. <laughs> He's from 2003. <laughs> so, um, so here's from an email I sent actually in October of 1995. But right now I have exactly one Debian system up in the middle of several BSDI machines, two HP workstations, a Microvax 2, a handful of DOS machines, what a mess, running bits that are current, blah, 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 working on GPS. I've just finished building my AMD 29K cross compilation environment under Debian, dot, dot, dot. Um, I don't know, when I read this, this sort of portends or foretells so many things I ended up doing in Debian over the next few years, but whatever. Um, I thought it would be interesting, though, <coughs> to point out that Debian at the time was really, really different. And I'll talk about where some of the changes occurred in a couple of minutes. When I say really, really different, um, when you got permission to upload things to Debian, you were given the login name and password of the FTP site that you uploaded the files into a particular directory of. Kind of like an anonymous FTP thing, but not generally available. And Ian Murdoch would personally go look at what you'd uploaded, decide it was okay, and move the files into the file system that represented the public view of what Debian was. Uh, there was nothing but 
what we would now think of as unstable. It was, you know, people uploaded stuff and if Ian thought it looked okay, it went in the archive. And so, um, we also, this is before, when I first started, uh, DPKG was just starting to appear. And it didn't work quite the way it did today. Um, <clears throat> one of the things was when you made a change to something, you would actually manually craft an email and send it to this Debian Changes mailing list. You'll notice that was hosted at pixar.com. That's where Bruce worked at the time. Uh, those of you who understand will we'll understand that association is what's led us to have Toy Story related code names for our releases for a whole long time since. And it's like, okay, I've done this. And oh, by the way, you know, there's this bug in D changes where it gets upset if you're doing a native package instead of you know, a normal package. So I hacked and put in a zero length diff.gz file and that made it work. Um, and then <coughs> the rest of that message was the output of the D changes tool at that time. And uh, a couple things I thought were worth pointing out. Um, first of all, file sizes, man. This is back when you know, men were men and software was small. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> so it's zero to diff that you said and a 52.6 kilobyte dot dev file. I don't know if it's possible to make a dev file that small anymore. If it is, it's kind of interesting. Um, and this was before we had DSCs and before we had all of this source packaging format choice stuff that we have these days. But a lot of things that you probably uh, think of as being sort of important in Debian do show up there. There's you know, source difference between source and binary packages and priorities and all those sorts of things. Um, <coughs> but, you know, um, it's sort of what we had and that was kind of the way things worked at the time. And we did real work with it. Um, you know, within a year or so, uh, we had finished developing the module for MSOT Oscar 40. This is a shot in the year 2000 in Kourou, French Guiana, when we were preparing the satellite to go on uh, an Ariane 5 launch vehicle. That's me, sort of on the left side, sitting there with a the bright blue beanie thing on. It was tight enough to compress my brain cells. Um, anyway, I spent a summer in French Guiana putting that spacecraft on a satellite. Much of the software that was running on the processes embedded in that satellite was developed on Debian systems. Okay, so back to sort of Debian milestones. If we think about the early history of Debian in terms of releases, all of this stuff is actually documented in our Debian history, project history, depending on which way you look at it, document. But, you know, August 1993 was the first supposed release of Debian. And I'll be honest and tell you, I don't have any idea what that looked like. I was not involved with the project that early. But that was Ian Murdoch's first snapshot of the work that he'd done. Um, by January of 1994, um, he had written the Debian Linux Manifesto. How many of you have read that? What's wrong with the rest of you? <laughs> no, seriously. Um, I, I'm, I hope by the time I'm done, you'll understand that it's really important. I think it's really important to not just read these foundational documents, but to sort of understand them and think about what they meant. Um, if we think about what was going on at that time, there were in the world nothing, no other examples of something we would today think of as a Linux distribution. And my apologies to anybody in there that might have been involved with things like SLS back then, but <clears throat> what we think of today is like a distribution with packages and a package management system and installation tools and all that. It really just doesn't exist before Debian. And part of what Ian Murdoch brought to the table was this recognition that it ought to be possible for us to do this better. It ought to be easier uh, to install you know, a free software operating system and, and use it. And you know, by the time he got to 1994, he had written the Debian Linux Manifesto, which was his articulation of what he thought he was trying to accomplish and what was going to be interesting and different about Debian. And I'll pull the key points of that out to talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, that was also the first time Debian had anything like a package manager. And it was not DPKG, it was the predecessor. And again, I don't remember what it was called, it's been too long. But um, Ian said a couple times, there were about a dozen contributors at that time, and it was the last time he did what he thought of as a one-man release. 
So by the time you roll forward a few more months and get to March of 1995, um, that, the 0.93 R5 release, um, and personally I got involved somewhere around 0.92 if I remember correctly, but by the time we got to March of 95, all of a sudden we had this concept of explicit package maintainers. One of the things that I really remember about that time period was that before that, if you were someone like me and you stumbled over a bug or a misfeature in some piece of software in Debian, the process was you'd go grab the source files associated with that package. You'd unpack them, you'd look at them. <laughs> and by the way, unpack them, you undid the tar and then manually overlaid the diff. That's sort of how it worked. And then you'd go take a look, and you'd see whose name was the most recently listed one in the changelog file. And if, 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 they, you know, if there was a clearly indicated somebody who most recently changed it, the polite thing to do was to contact them and say, I want to go fix this bug and upload it. Do you happen to be about to do another upload and I might conflict with what you're working on? Or can I go ahead and do this and you'll pick it up and it'll be okay? This is because we didn't really have revision control systems in general, like widespread use at that time. Uh, some of us knew enough to be using them ourselves, but in some sense, the way the whole concept of packages and uploading versions of packages came into being was this sort of way of having something like a revision control system working at the granularity of packages and allowing people to work in a fully distributed, not always internet connected way, because the internet was young. <coughs> the web was really young. You know, the idea of, oh, we'll just put up a web page about this and have all this dynamic content. Ha, ha, ha. It didn't exist yet, right? <coughs> so the concept of having explicit ma package maintainers originally came around because of the bug tracking system, as far as I can tell. And the notion that if you were going to let people file bugs in some kind of a central bug tracking system, who was going to read them? You know, the project had already gotten to the point where there were so many packages that everybody, like seeing all the mail about all the bugs all the time, wasn't going to scale very well. And so the idea of designating a particular person to sort of be responsible for reading the bugs and being responsible for that package made sense. But the key thing I want to convey is I, at least, never saw that as sort of taking away my ability or empowerment to go fix something. If there's a bug and you had time to work on it, you were supposed to fix it. <clears throat> and of course, you should talk to the other people who are involved in that piece of code and coordinate some. But the idea that somebody else was responsible, therefore I shouldn't be allowed to work on it, never entered my mind at all. And it's kind of strange that in the years since then, I've seen flurries of activity on mailing lists and you know, tit for tat bugs, bug wars and BTS where there are clearly people who think that somehow because they're the designated maintainer that some, somehow that makes them God. And I, <coughs> I push back on that concept. I, if I were to sort of exhort everyone to do something differently slash better going forward, it's you know, figure out how to collaborate better and don't be afraid to jump in and work on things when it looks like something needs to be done. The other thing that's really important is that's the release where DPKG first showed up in a sort of publicly visible kit and everything changed. Um, DPKG predates RPM. It was the first real package manager um, used by a Linux distribution. Uh, later, when we added explicit dependencies to the Debian packaging system, it was the first uh, package management system for any kind of operating system anywhere that I was aware of that had that sort of capability. Um, I worked for HP at the time. We had this crazy tool for managing packages in HPUX, and it certainly didn't have anything like Debian-style package, uh, inter-package relationship dependency management. So, you know, there was a lot of innovation going on here, a lot of things that, that all of a sudden made Debian really pretty cool. <coughs> the first release I personally had code in was the November 95 0.93 R6. That's where Deselect first showed up. How many of you still use Deselect? I do. Please don't take it away. <laughs> the problem is when Ian Jackson first built the prototype of that, he, up, he thought it was a prototype. He uploaded it and he said, I'm really not good at designing user interfaces. Will somebody please fix that? 
And the problem was that after it had been around for a couple of days, many of us like knew the keystrokes by heart and could drive it with our eyes closed. We didn't want it to change. So whatever. Um, other people came along and did smarter things later. And uh, apt, oh my god, apt. Um, it fixed a huge scalability problem with deselect and deselect on top of apt, whatever. Um, amazing things that changed. By that point, there were about 60 people involved in the project, and I was immensely proud to be one of them. That was a really cool time in history. And it meant that, you know, a couple years later, um, you know, the project kept growing. More people were showing up uh, as it became easier to install Debian, easier to use Debian, updates worked. You could actually update across release boundaries and not have to reinstall, which is sort of a novel concept to a lot of people. Um, more people came and wanted to play. And then what happened is we had so many people joining the project, it wasn't possible just by word of mouth and casual conversation for everybody to sort of learn what the project really was about and what it meant and for that incorporation of our core values to happen automatically. And there were starting to be some disagreements amongst developers, not just about how to do technical things, but about what our responsibilities were and how we were supposed to interact with each other. And that's what led to the creation of the DFSG and the associated, uh, well, the social contract and the associated DFSG. Because the social contract was, in effect, an expression of our project's core values. And those core values were things we were all going to agree on, and they would help to guide our decision making on all of these soft boundary topics going forward. And one of the things it said is that, well, you know, we're going to do free. And we had to define what free meant. And the moment the Debian free software guidelines were out, people looked at it and went, wow, that's cool. That's articulate. It's crisp. It's concise. And all of a sudden, sites like Sunsight, people remember Sunsight? <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, Sunsight said, um, henceforth, the DFSG is the litmus test for what will allow on Sunsight. And you know, a couple years later, the open source definition appears, and it's a copy and edit of the DFSG. Everybody understood that. Um, and then the last sort of early milestone that I think is really significant was the release of Debian 2.0 in July of 98. And the reason I think that's so significant is it's the first time we had a non 32-bit x86 architecture. And that's, in my mind, in a lot of ways, is the moment Debian really became what many of us have thought about it being ever since. It was, ooh, <laughs> yeah, right, stay. <laughs> I have to admit, um, recently I had one of those moments you don't like to have. Uh, Keith and I designed little bits of USB attached electronics. And, uh, for the first time, I designed one that actually needs to have like a 12 volt car battery attached to it for running the pyro channels. And uh, in order to make development easier, I put a jumper into the board's design so that when we we're first turning them on, we could power them from USB power. The hardware folks in the room probably know exactly what happened next. Um, I forgot to take the jumper off when I hooked it to a 12 volt battery, and I dumped 12 volts into a laptop. And I had one of those releasing the magic smoke events. So. This laptop, it's like my last working laptop. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so the, if I look at it from sort of the standpoint of release milestones, everything that's happened since Debian 2.0 has been cool, but it's been just like, yeah, turn on the crank. We added more architectures, we added a lot more packages. We added a lot more people, people went MIA, all sorts of things have happened since. These are some of the, the sort of early transition points. but. I have another view, uh, a few other things, and these were sort of things that either I was really involved in or really got my attention for some other reason. Um, as I mentioned, in uh, the fall of 1995, that's when I first sort of made a, a technical contribution to Debian. Almost immediately, when I was sort of officially part of Debian, Bruce Perrins reached out to me and says, I have a real concern. And I think you can help me with this. Would you be willing to? And I said, well, that depends on what it is, Bruce. It turns out that um, up until that time, uh, ftp.debian.org, which was like the only publicly visible Debian machine, was a PC under a guy's desk at Central Michigan University. And that had been working pretty much okay. 
But apparently, every time Ian Murdoch uploaded a few things and put an email out about you know, another update to the archive, Central Michigan University, which had a finitely sized connection to the internet, um, <laughs> saw their internet pipe get really busy for a while. And there was great concern about how long uh, this particular individual would be, would be allowed to keep <coughs> ftp.wn.org under his desk. Um, some interactions with him about this and his uh, apparent not really sort of understanding what the problem were left Bruce and Ian Murdoch both very concerned that we could all of a sudden one day find the only Debian.org associated machine just not being there anymore. And since Bruce knew that I was running large FTP mirrors of some other projects inside HP, he said, would you please set up a mirror of ftp.debian.org and just grab a copy of the bits in case something bad happens. And I said, sure, I could do that. And then I realized that none of the machines I had sitting around had enough space, and all of a sudden the messages from Bruce got much more urgent. But could you do this quickly, please? <coughs> um, and so I scrounged around, I found a cast off 486, 66, uh, for 66 megahertz 486 HP Vectra tower. And I found an Adaptex 1740 ESA SCSI card and two hard drives to put in it. Uh, a 330 megabyte drive for the system disk and a 660 megabyte drive for the archive. And um, we actually did multiple releases off of that machine where the entire release fit well within 660 megabytes. Well, thanks to Noodles, uh, at lunch yesterday we pulled some stats out of the database. Today, there are 404 packages in the Debian archive that are bigger than 330 megabytes. <laughs> and there are 80 packages in the archive that are bigger than 660 megabytes. And guess what? One of the ones that we would have had trouble fitting is the Linux kernel. So, <laughs> it just, to me, you know, when I tell people, look, my first computer had you count them, 256 bytes of RAM. They all look at me and go, you old fart, you know. <coughs> Quit saying, get off my lawn and you know, go back to whatever it is old people do. But, <laughs> but this is Debian. This is a Debian, this is like a major Debian, it was the major Debian server. And the one thing I said was, look, from a corporate networking security standpoint, I'm happy to run this machine. I'm happy to keep this mirror. <coughs> what I can't do is make it be the public ftp.debian.org. So the reason we created master was this notion that this is where all the uploads will go. We will craft the distribution here, and we'll let all comers volunteer to provide hosting space for copies of the archive. And all the public access will be through that you know, layer of mirrors. And so, you know, I guess in some sense, I'm the one that sort of suggested we needed to have a mirror network, and it was entirely for um, self-motivating reasons. Uh, I didn't want to get fired. <coughs> um, and then, uh, unfortunately, uh, in March of 1996, uh, that period sort of came to an end because I was about to be visited by corporate internal auditors. And I was the guy managing the department that owned the data center that was hosting that machine. But I knew we were going to have other things we'd have to deal with with the auditors, and I didn't want to have to explain this. And so I sent a couple emails around that month and said it, uh, uh, to people I thought might be able to help and said, is there anyone else who can host master.debian.org? And Simon Shapiro and Mike Neufer at iConnect stuck their hands up and volunteered. Um, I ended up cutting a DAT tape to send them with a copy of the mirror contents and they put it up, and that sort of ended my directly running master at Debian.org. And then, also in that same month, something that not many people realize is that that's when Ian Murdoch himself left the project. And it wasn't because there was a problem. In fact, things were going great. It's because Ian wanted to go finish his degree. Uh, I think he was working on a graduate degree at the time. I don't remember the exact details. I think he was at Arizona State. Um, not sure. Anyway. He said several years later in an interview that he felt fine about leaving, that he was leaving it in the capable hands of Bruce, Ian Jackson, and myself. And I feel immensely sort of gratified by that because I wasn't doing much. I was busy working on an amateur satellite project. Uh, Bruce kind of took over by de facto as the visible leader of the project. Ian Jackson was doing DPKG and the bug tracking system and various other things. And I guess I was kind of trying to help keep infrastructure running. 
I remember being the DNS guy for a while, and this is, we didn't have to like find a manager for the key ring because we were not yet using keys to manage uploads. <coughs> um, yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> Um, then the next sort of huge milestone from my perspective was in March of 1998 when Bruce Parents left Debian. That was a whole different kettle of fish. Um, what had happened is that we had all sort of come to the agreement that, hey, this being the leader of the project thing, now that it's not the founder, Ian Murdoch, we should probably like vote for that. We should pick somebody from amongst the developers. And so we came up with this voting mechanism, and the original thought that people had was, gee, the three of you guys are kind of it. Why don't you run against each other, and we'll pick one of you to be the project leader. And I said, not me. I'm heads down working on this satellite project, and I have young kids at home, and I don't have time for this right now. And so Bruce and Ian were going to, you know, uh, there's going to be an election to pick which one of them was DPL. And in the middle of the run-up to that vote, um, Bruce, for various reasons, decided he'd had enough of Debian and disappeared. And the reason that was such a big problem is that we hadn't thought about it, but all the mailing lists were running off of config files in his home directory at Pixar, and he just arm-r'd the whole subtree, not intentionally trashing the mailing list. He kind of forgot that the mailing list <laughs> stuff was there. But he eradicated our mailing list infrastructure in one command line command. And I think, honestly, that's probably the closest Debian ever came to just ceasing to exist. Because there was a huge scramble for those of us who were sort of around the project to kind of get in touch with each other and figure out what to do. And we didn't have each other's phone numbers and all that kind of stuff. And within a day or two, somebody had gotten in touch with Bruce and he apologized and found a backup tape and pulled the mailing list stuff back and put it back up until we could move it somewhere else. And Oh, that was a huge kerfluffle. <coughs> but we survived it. And I sort of, you know, I took a deep breath and said, okay, um, we need to do better than that going forward. And then the last thing I'll mention in sort of my personal sort of big moments in project history was, you know, I think it was first in about March or April of 1996 that somebody sent an email around, I don't remember who it was, and said, you know, Debian's getting so big Maybe we need to split it into a core and something other than core and have sort of a different set of rules about how we manage them in the archive and got shouted down because there was no clear reason to do that. And, you know, creating a second class citizenship among some of the packages didn't make sense. Well, that whole idea came back up again in early 1998. And, you know, by then we were starting to think about wanting to have more than one copy of Debian, more than one distribution available. And I stuck my hands up and said, look, uh, I don't think sort of arbitrarily fracturing a set of packages is the best thing to do. But I threw out an idea of treating our archive as more like a cache. And over time, that evolved into what Anthony Towns and James Troop and others eventually implemented as package pools. And the interesting thing is before that, it is literally true that the way we did a stable release of Debian is that we copied unstable and spent as much time as it took bug fixing it until we thought it was okay to release it. And is Brandon in the room? I don't see him. I remember at least one early release where we sat up half the night waiting for Brandon to rebuild all of X so that we could fix that one last nasty bug in X and get it released. I don't remember which release it was. But um, I'm so happy that we don't do things that way anymore. Okay, so the Debian Linux Manifesto, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these things, but you really should, if you haven't, go read Ian's Manifesto. It's one of the clearest articulations of sort of what he thought the point of Debian was, and these are the key points, that it's a brand new kind of distribution developed openly in the spirit of Linux and GNU. He was really impressed by the Linux kernel maintainer's development process, and he really liked the GPL, and when you intersected those two, that's what he was thinking he was trying to create with Debian. But he told me, and other people at various times, that he had no idea it, that Debian would ever become what it is. That he, he didn't have that much vision, really. He, he knew something he could do that would make an incremental move in the right direction, and the rest of it is all because of the rest of us and all the things we've done over the years that have made it really happen. Carefully and conscientiously put together, la la la. 
Uh, Linux is not a commercial product, never should be, but that doesn't mean it, that it can't be able to com compete commercially. I thought that was really interesting and sort of prescient given lots of things that have happened since. And as I mentioned, one of the things that happened is that as the project grew, it became harder to ensure that everybody knew coming to the project had a uniform sense of what it meant to be part of Debian. And that's what led us to create the social contract and its core artic articulation of what our core values were. And we've argued over time about, you know, would we write the same thing today if we were starting over? <coughs> I hope at least on the core values level, we wouldn't have a very different set of opinions because this still reads pretty well to me. Um, and then as we continue to grow, and particularly after the events surrounding Bruce's departure, it became really clear that in a constitution, some means of having sort of pre-thought out formal processes for deciding how to resolve things when stuff got weird was important. And that's how we ended up with the Debian Constitution. Um, while Bruce had acted as the editor and sort of collator of the content for the uh, social contract, Ian actually was the principal author of the Constitution. And there are a couple of things about our Constitution that I think um, reflect the experiences we'd had and the circumstances involved. You know, our Constitution does this interesting thing of leaving explicitly, leaving the vast majority of responsibility in the hand of individual Debian developers. And it reserves only specific, sort of carefully bounded responsibilities for the technical committee, for the secretary, for the Debian project leader. And I think at least in part, that structuring and that sense of prioritization was informed by the sequence of events, including Bruce's abrupt departure. But in any case, an awful lot of interesting stuff uh, came about as a consequence of the creation of this constitution. And it's certainly true that over the years, an awful lot of people have looked at our use of a preference-based voting system and said, in particular, that was a really cool choice. And it's made things possible that otherwise would have been really, really difficult for us as a project as we continued to scale. And of course, it wasn't just the project that was scaling. <laughs> That was, that was one of my favorite airframes. It's unfortunately one of the ones I lost in the fire, but that was about 260 millimeters in diameter. And, well, you can see that's me holding it up in the Pawnee grasslands in northern Colorado. Uh, I had fun flying that. The highest I ever went was a little bit over three kilometers above ground. Um, it was a heck of a lot of fun flying a rocket that was big and fat. I'm building one now that's a little bit bigger in diameter and will be about twice as long. <coughs> and, uh, I had thought maybe I'd have that ready in time to fly this year, but not so much. Too many other fun things going on. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of other things that I think have been really, really important um, to why Debian has continued to work. And it has to do with the way we capture best practices and turn those into an articulated policy. I think that's been absolutely essential for us to be able to scale to where we are today with so many different people working on so many different pieces of software and having them all kind of fit together as a distribution. There's been a lot of discussion here at this DevCon <coughs> about whether, in fact, we have some big problems on the horizon. We've talked for years about, oh my god, you know, can we actually package Java applications using the same kind of policies and the same approach? And in some ways, Java is a whole lot more like C than some of the other languages and programming environments people are using today. And you know, as we talk about how we're going to deal with containers and flat packs and all sorts of other stuff, I think it's really important for us to sort of stay bounded <coughs> in, or stay you know, tied to what our original fundamental core set of values were, um, and look for innovative ways to package it in. in aggregate things so that we can continue providing sort of the best collection of software possible. I also think the public bug tracking system, the fact that, you know, every bug that's been reported in all of our packages with a couple of weird exceptions related to security embargoes, is just out there where everybody in the world can see it, is an immensely important thing. Um, in my professional career, I had the opportunity to do things like try to console customers who were working with a particular commercial distributor and they would report a bug and one of our field engineers would root cause it and find a fix and submit a patch to the distributor 
and that patch would disappear into the distributor's internal distribution mechanisms and bug tracking things, and sometime later out would come a new kernel, and the assertion that your problem is fixed in this new kernel. And particularly for our customers in places like Japan, who demanded that we be able to demonstrate to them, you know, what fix, what change was made to fix their problem, that lack of transparency was really challenging. And it was always just so much easier to work with Debian where all these things were right out there where we could see them. And so I think that remains really important. And I'll sort of wrap up the <laughs> me standing here talking part by throwing out a few thoughts about what I think really matters about Debian. It starts out with being about freedom. Um, it ends up being about freedom too. But I think the fact that we have a stable functional community has been immensely important. And what I mean by stable functional communities, even though we've had some huge pissing matches amongst ourselves over the years, a couple of which I'm really familiar with, um, <laughs> the non-vocal majority of maintainers and, and DDs just keep doing their thing. And on any given day, even in the middle of some of our biggest flame wars, Package updates have been getting uploaded, we've been updating our archive, and everybody downstream of us has kind of gone, yeah, you guys will figure it out, and in the meantime, we'll keep using the bits. And I think that that's been really pretty cool. Uh, there's an awful lot of architectures, an awful lot of packages, they wear us out sometimes. And, you know, I take some personal responsibility for how many architectures we had at one point. I think there are at least three I can point to that I started the ports of. Um, all but one of which are completely gone, and that one's going to be dead soon. So, <coughs> whatever mistake that might have represented is self-correcting. Um, <coughs> but the fact that we're sort of open to contributions, and anyone who wants to come join our community and has an idea about something new they want to support, we have mechanisms to make it possible for them to do that. It's just been immensely enabling. And then finally, there is this huge downstream dependency chain. I don't know if you've noticed. I, You've heard, if you've been sitting in talks here, various people have said it. I hope you all understand it, realize it, and know that it's true. An immense number of people in the world use the bits that we work on in Debian. When we craft something, it doesn't matter whether the end user gets it through us or through Ubuntu or through, I don't know, any of a number of other, you know, through Tails or through whatever, all these derivative distributions, there are companies that you know, take all kinds of it. It was fun when I was sitting on HP's internal open source review board and I would see a proposal come through that was about nothing related to Debian, but where they needed to grab sources from somewhere. And I would recognize a Debianified version number in the thing they were asking us to approve. And why did they do that? Because they knew that if we got the source package from Debian main, it came with a certain set of assurances. And so we're embedded in an awful lot of really interesting places. And I think that's pretty cool. So a bunch of you have asked me, you know, what have I done recently with rockets? Um, that's my most recent project. Uh, the picture on the left is the last time I saw the airframe intact. Um, <laughs> because we have such lovely telemetry from the air uh, airframe in flight, I know that it did Mach 3.1 on the way to just under 10 kilometers above ground. Um, I also, you know, with the shovel, was able to find the back end of it about a half a meter below ground. Um, and what I really wanted to know was could I build the fin can assembly such that it would survive going faster than Mach 3. And the amazing thing is that yes, I could, because you can't really see it very well in this photo, but of the three fins, two are completely intact. Not even really scratched, no cracks. Yes, the paint was partially scraped off, you know, digging down through the dirt after it hit the ground. And the only reason the third one failed, um, there was a rock about the size of my fist in the ground. So it would not have gone to 32,000 feet above ground if it had not remained intact and stable through the, the mock transitions. And this is simultaneously, therefore, really cool because I proved to myself that I could build something that would go that fast and stay together and really depressing because after getting those photos, we filled in the hole and walked away. <laughs> that was really hard clay and it was really hot and humid and there was no way we were gonna stand around long enough to dig that thing out of the ground. Okay, with that, I'm gonna stop just talking and open it up for questions. I hope that some of you have some. I think we have a whole bunch of time left, like almost another hour. And I would be happy to talk about almost anything from Debian's history 
anything sort of around that that you'd like to hear about. Yeah. So um, early in the history of Debian, somebody correct me, 1997, I think, is when SPI was created. I don't remember exactly. Um, Debian started out just being like a lot of other free software things, an amorphous group of people contributing to a technical work, and there was no legal or financial structure around. It got to a point where various folks thought it was important that there be some legal existence for the project, somebody that could hold trademarks and domain names and and in the United States, at least, there's an opportunity, if you have the right um, IRS-recognized status, to take donations from individuals for which they can claim a, a tax deduction. And that seemed like a, a reasonable way to attract financial support for the project. And the, the, the sort of prescient or cool thing that happened was that instead of creating, like, the Debian Foundation, uh, the folks involved created this thing called Software in the Public Interest. And its original... Um, uh, charter sort of uh, said that it would um, support and enable the development of free software and related open hardware stuff. Now over time it's never actually done much that was useful in the hardware space, but on the software side, um, you know, over time the model under which SPI operates has allowed a large number three or four dozen over time, different projects to associate with SPI and become part of that legal and financial umbrella. So today, software and public interest is still in existence, it's still providing legal and financial services to Debian and to a bunch of other projects. And as of the SPI BOF yesterday, it was reported that for the first time, SPI's held assets are now above a million bucks, and that makes it kind of real. And uh, so there's a lot of work amongst the current board there to, you know, ramp up the sort of formality of some of their processes and become an even better fiscal sponsoring organization than it's been in the past. I'm certainly pleased that uh, after spending about a decade as president of SPI that it's still not just a going thing but a thriving thing. Yeah, Tom. So beyond the words and the documents, Looking back over time in Debian, what is the, uh, what do you think is the uh, intention of Debian towards users? Um, in particular, I come to Debian as a developer, it's fantastic as a developer, but what, did, what was the thought about Debian for users originally and, and, and also how do you see what a user looks like in the past, present, and future? I think it's evolved. I mean, I think when we first started, the notion that there's really a distinction between developers and users isn't something that many of us thought about very much because if you run the clock back to that time, I mean, this thing called the web was really new. Public access to the internet was still, at least in my mind, kind of a new thing. I mean, I remember when I got my first email access when I was an undergraduate student at Carnegie Mellon, it was on this thing called the ARPANET with a side order of, you know, Usenet, U, well, UCP, Usenet was just the news distribution part. Um, and, you know, it was a very, very different thing. It was very elitist, very cliquish. Only people who had either, you know, were part of a university that was on the net or had a DARPA contract or something could use it. And then, you know, the commercialization of the ARPANET happened and it became the internet and it, over time, evolved into this amazing, chaotic, weird thing that we all use today. And so at that point in time, there weren't that many people who had computers who weren't geeks. And so when we talked about users, what I really thought about in the early days were people who wanted to do things like write software or build hardware for like an amateur radio satellite. There were certainly people in my circle of friends who didn't want to work on Debian. They wanted to use it to go do something interesting. And if you look back at what packages were included in like the 0.9.3 release, the reason it fit in, you know, 660 megabytes of hard disk and really could be distributed on a set of floppies um, without sources <coughs> is that we didn't have huge big pieces of software in there. I don't remember if we had a web browser at all in that time period. We probably did, but I don't remember. 
I know we had GCC. <coughs> I know we had Emacs. Um, and you know, if you have Emacs and GCC, you know all the world is yours, right? So <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, you know, it, it, being completely blunt about this, having grown up, you know, in the era of like old Unix on 16-bit processors and spending an awful lot of time on early commercial Unix on early 32-bit processors. Um, Linux was this huge breath of fresh air, but um, I laughed when my daughter, uh, at about age nine, asked why she didn't, couldn't have a Debian machine too, and I said, well, of course you can. And I had to explain to her sort of what would and wouldn't work, and she decided to go ahead with it, and we installed Debian for her on a desktop PC. And the very first thing she wanted to know, I think it was Star Office at the time that we had installed for her, the first thing she wanted to know was how to change the font in the text editor. And I don't believe I had ever personally cared about the font. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what the second question was? Take a while, guys. Color. How do you change the color of the text? And oh my god, I certainly never cared about the color of the text. <laughs> so, you like green. <laughs> I didn't really like green. Um, I actually bought monitors that were amber phosphor because I was into amber, not green. But, um, yeah, the Amdeck 310A, is that the right? God, do I really remember that? Yeah, with the, with the anti-glare screen and whew. Microterm Ergo 4000 terminals because they were 80 columns by 66 lines and we did 19.2. Um, yeah, 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 we date ourselves. Um, so I think at that time, I really didn't see a huge distinction between users and developers. And over time, thanks to my daughter, and then I had some really interesting experiences. Actually, the first time I met Gunnar in Mexico, uh, we were attending a conference in Veracruz. And one of the things that happened at that conference is someone, someone local, was teaching a how to install Debian workshop thing on the side. And I went and sat in the back of the room. And there were a bunch of, I don't know, high school or college age kids in there. I mean, to me, they seem like kids. And there were a lot of female participants. In fact, there were many girls in that room, and I don't, I, you know, I, I don't know how they got there or what the context was, but they were. And what I noticed is they were taking this incredible number of notes, and I stumbled over the fact that they were simultaneously trying to deal with the language translation, because at that time, boot floppies only worked in English. And so it was sort of, here's this thing it's going to ask you during the install. What does that mean? How do you want to answer it? And how do you do that in English? And it was an incredible mental load. And that was one of those epiphanies I had about, oh man, these people just want to use a computer and they want to use cool software on it and we're making it really hard. And that's why when I ran for DPL in 2002 and then successfully, well, 2001 and successfully in 2002, my platform was full of stuff about we need to do a better job at internationalization, particularly in the installer. Because I'd sat in that room and watched those, those poor kids taking pages and pages of notes to remember how to answer the questions dealing with the language translation and everything. So I gradually personally came to an understanding that there was a broader base of users. But I will not pretend that even today I care very much about people who want to drag and drop things in a GUI. I just don't understand why anybody would do that. <laughs> Enrico. Uh, thanks for um, um, putting some more history of Debian on record, at least on video. Uh, it occurred to me recently that uh, Debian is starting to have such a long history that people who joined it recently can feel daunted by not really, um, not really being feeling a part of it because whatever. Um, Whatever happens, somebody around will say, yeah, you think that's a tough transition. I remember when you switched from A out to Elf. Oh, that yeah. was a transition. Oh, yeah. And, and, and man, the day Bash stopped working on Unstable. And, yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and, and so, um, and it occurred to me that Debian is getting old enough that it might make sense to have some document somewhere that can be a little history lesson because, well, I guess the reason, one of the reasons I, I was told history when I was in primary school is that I knew uh, how the, the, the environment around myself came to be. And, yep. and I guess that means 
getting there. So great for this, and I wish for more that, uh, and even the teams could have a little bit of history of teams so that people can join, can kind of get up to speed on the major past events. And incidentally, how did you manage to pull out the AI out to health transition? I recall I pressed enter at the time and, this is, and, and hit behind the sofa and when I came out the system upgraded and it kept working. <laughs> 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 So, like so many things that happen in Debian, it has to do with being careful about how you name things and what you choose for paths and sort of not trying to do things entirely in place. You know, you could, it, it's like so many things, you have to have the prerequisites in place, you have to have a kernel installed that understands both the new and the old, and then you have to have the right new libraries installed, and then you have to start installing binaries that depend on the new libraries and not the old ones. And, can you also uh, add a bit of introduction of what is A out? <laughs> what is A out? It's the thing we had before ELF. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, if you look back in history, the thing that I think was probably the most significant um, in all of that was the transition from um, static to shared libraries. And um, that's when I sort of remember things changing a lot. It wasn't a hugely difficult transition because since by then we had dependency management in our packaging system, you could do things like say, and by the way, we didn't have Delp helper back then, so we had to manually craft the dependencies to say, I depend on this version of libc, and oh, Lord, the bugs. Um, there are reasons we built tooling for this stuff, people, and use it because it's the right thing to do. Um, I don't know what we do these days without Lentium to help remind us that, oh, something changed since the last time you uploaded this you lazy guy two years ago. Um, <clears throat> or in the case of GZIP, since the last stable release a decade or so ago. Um, but yeah, those I, you know, trying to actually talk about any specific one of those transitions, I don't know if it's all that illuminating, but it's the same thing we have had to do a number of times since then, where somebody has to sit down and plan it out. And you have to think about, okay, how do I make sure that the old and the new can kind of coexist during the transition period? And it's hard. But, I mean, if you really want to talk about specifics of something, I guess we can. But that seems like it's getting a little gnarly. Yeah. Go ahead. A quick comment and a quick question. Um, for a person who says it doesn't care about fonts and colors, all of the rockets are beautifully painted and your presentation uses like this modern sans serif font which looks stunning on screen. So a I guess, modern font? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Keith, what is the vintage of ITC Ben Gurion Gothic? I would know. Anyway. Um, I, I, Question, uh, how was... By, by, by the way, the reason I'm using this font is that um, Keith gives me crap if my slides use more than one font. I used to cut and paste things all the time and just didn't care about changing the fonts. And I'm told they look really ugly, but I don't know. Oh no, consistent typography just makes all the difference. I, I've been told this. <laughs> as long as I can read it, I'm good. Yeah. The question I have is how did Pixar.com got involved? Because for me, it was a bit of a surprise to see I'm sorry, Pixar.com. Because like Bruce I, worked there. Bruce worked there, and that's the only connection. Yeah. Or it's I mean, the reason master.debian.org was hosted by HP when it first started is because I worked there and I didn't ask permission. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. I mean, I had a brief moment as I was waiting for it to install off floppy where I was going, huh, I wonder if I'm going to get in trouble for this. <laughs> And the entire time master.debian.org was hosted in the little data centers that I ran, I, at the time I was the technical computing manager for the R&D and manufacturing organization within HP Colorado Springs. I had about, I don't know, a dozen people working for me and we maintained several thousand systems on site. And this is one of our, you know, computer rooms and nobody really cared. It was on our, it was one more server we were backing up in our mega backup system and was using our uninterruptible power and it was on our internet connection and the internet was built kind of in big clumps and it didn't actually put us across the threshold so nobody knew. And I'm sure that initially things were similar to Pixar. It was really, really funny many years later when HP decided to officially support Debian and started publicly talking about how proud they were to have been the hosters of the original master of <laughs> <laughs> I let them get away with it. I, 
I, I want to step back for just one second, because Enrico, I didn't address the other thing you talked about, which was capturing history. Um, I realized a bunch of years ago that that was someday going to seem important, and it's the reason I personally sort of took ownership or responsibility or whatever for trying to keep this thing we call, depending on how you look at it, either Debian history or project history. It's one name in the web and the other one in the packaging system um, alive and try to keep that up to date. Um, I don't know why, but that's something that, despite my best intentions, I've never done a very good job of keeping that up to date. It exists only because other people look at it and go, oh, dude, we have a new DPL, here's a patch to add them to the history. Um, so I would encourage all of you, doesn't matter how long you've been around, go take a look at that document. If there's something you go, hmm, doesn't mention this, write it up. I mean, preferably in the form of a patch, but uh, even just an email would be great. Uh, I have realized in the last couple of weeks, spelunking through, I found backups of laptops that I was using in like 1998 that had copies of email that you know dated back to the mid 90s that I'd forgotten I had. And so I've had the pleasure the last couple of weeks of reading you know, the emails where we did things like moved master.wn.org and who the people were involved and all that. I don't know, you'd think being retired again now that I'd have time to do more of this stuff, but who knows if I'll ever get around to writing more. I made the mistake during my return to HP of committing to be co-author on a significant update of an existing book. I'm so glad they told me to go away so I didn't have to finish that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just being serious. It, it turns out I love to write things. The problem is when I sit down to write something, it's a laborious process because I have a minor in poetry and I care about words. And, it's hard. It, it, just to get things to where I'm actually happy reading them is hard. So I encourage all of you who have a few minutes, go read that document and please, you know, send patches to the BTS with suggested additions or improvements because I think that's one thing we can do to try and capture more of this. A bunch of the things I've thrown in here are things I went back and pulled out of there. So if you care about when things happened and, you know, who we memorialized and which releases, there's a lot of that sort of stuff that's around. Yeah, I agree. Right. So, while running by people in corridors here, I've heard the idea of establishing a Patreon for the, uh, for the people to be able to pay money to the packages they're using so that developers can be paid and maybe going forwarding that up to upstreams. Could you enlighten people about the history of developers being paid? <laughs> <laughs> And maybe expose on the idea in the, for the future. So, uh, in terms of being publicly paid, there was this thing that affectionately became known as Dunk Tank, um, <laughs> where there was an explicit attempt to raise money from companies that cared about Debian to be able to pay stable release managers to do their job. And that was tried for at least one release cycle, and I thought it actually helped because I thought it allowed people to put more time and attention on a task that nobody in the project really wanted to do. Um, and I thought generally that was quite positive. The unfortunate consequence is there were a number of important people to the Debian project who were really upset that somebody else was getting paid to do their part of the work and they weren't getting paid to do their part of the work. And I thought that was grossly unfair. And so I think that if you want to run some kind of a public system like that, it has to be structured in such a way that everybody involved in the project has at least some opportunity to participate. And that's the thing that I think would be really important, is that it isn't picking one or two people to publicly fund and everybody else kind of eh, keep doing what you're doing. Because that's the thing that I think really hurt at that time. Full public disclosure, I thought it was an interesting experiment to run and I made sure my employer kicked up some money to be part of that. Um, the other thing many people don't know is when we were trying to get the PA risk and Itanium ports of Debian done, uh, HP spent a few million dollars getting that done. We let contracts with um, more than one consultancy um, who did a lot of work for us. Uh, specifically working on patches to packages in Debian. The interesting thing about Itanium is it was not the first 64-bit architecture in Debian, but it was the first 64-bit architecture where the actual machines spread the physical memory out across the entire address space. 
those smart hardware guys in Fort Collins realized that if they used higher order address bits to pick which bank of SIMs, it made the machine ever so slightly faster. And as a consequence, it was the first time we actually were using high order address bits in the 64-bit address space. And oh my god, did we break a lot of software. <laughs> um, I don't know how many of you remember, but um, when James Troop was, Elmo was the FTP master, he actually approved something called the Zero Tolerance for Porting Problems Policy, which was permission to do non-delayed NMUs of anything if the only changes were adding include lines to the headers of the things that Configure was trying to run. Because back then, you know, programmers were lazy and they'd create a little program source code to test some feature on the system, but they wouldn't bother to hash include STDIO or you know, malloc or malloc.h or any of that sort of stuff. And <coughs> the consequence was that the compiler would make an assumption that you know, things were a certain size and that didn't sort of match what it needed to be, and you'd end up getting seg faults when the tests ran, and so configure would fail. And it turns out this is because we were we had RAM that was actually in parts of the address space that it had never been in before, and so we had addresses with non-zero bits in the high order half. So truncating it to 32 bits kind of messed up the address. Um, and so <coughs> I, I forget what the final total was, but it was like five million bucks or something that was spent directly on having people work on improving that part of Debian. I don't think most people ever even knew we were doing that, or if they did, they thought we were just, you know, Maybe we had people working for us or something, but the weirdness for me was that we were spending immense amounts of money getting the thing we cared about done in Debian, and nobody had a problem with it. In the moment, a tiny little bit of money got paid publicly to a couple people who had a really critical role to getting a release done, and it was done in a way where people felt like they were being disadvantaged, it broke horribly. So if I have any advice for the future, it's make sure that whatever system gets put in place is something where everybody can choose whether they want to participate or not and has the ability to be part of it. And if you do that, it might work. It certainly won't work if somebody else decides who gets to participate, which packages are important, which ones aren't, that sort of thing. Yeah. So you lectured us uh, about the milestones you saw while working along with Debian in the past 20 years and that made a difference in your opinion. Um, but that's looking backwards. If you yep. look in the future, what are the milestones you, would, you wish would happen in the next 20 years so that we continue to make the, such a big leap forward? Please don't break the things that matter to me. Um, <laughs> You know, that sounds a little facetious, but I fully recognize that my personal needs for a computing platform are not like a lot of other people. Not like a lot of other developers, certainly not like a lot of non-developer users. And um, this has come up a number of times. Um, I've been dropped on my head as a child on a number of desktop systems, and <clears throat> that means there are certain things I will probably never go try again. Um, I struggle constantly to sort of reduce the number of bits installed on my machines, both to reduce the attack surface and to keep from having all this code to understand. Drives me nuts when something that seems simple doesn't work and I can't figure out where to find the piece of source code that might be broken to go fix. And I admit it, look, you know, the first programming language I learned was, uh, I, it's funny, my first computer was based on the 1802 microprocessor and uh, when I was first programming it, um, I thought that the opcode mnemonics were, or excuse me, that the, that the hexadecimal versions of the binary values were assembly language because they weren't numbers. They, you know, they had A's through F's in them, so they couldn't possibly be numbers, right? Um, it wasn't until much later that I realized that, oh, that was still like machine code. That wasn't even assembly language. And having started there, and sort of been dragged kicking and screaming up through becoming a moderately competent shell and C programmer, I just don't understand <coughs> some of the things that some of you seem to think it's really great to write the code in these days. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, I took a class at Carnegie Mellon years ago taught by Mary Shaw of Wolf, Shaw, Hilfinger, and Flan fame called Comparative Programming Languages in which she sort of gave you rules for rapidly figuring out what the shape and nature of a new programming language were. And I've thought a couple times recently that she just didn't have the ability to anticipate some of the things people have ended up deciding would make good languages in recent years. But 
Um, this goes to some of the thing I was mentioning earlier. I think one of our big challenges going forward is to figure out how we're going to handle applications that are written in languages that have expectations about how source code is handled. And do they even have the concept of a binary that gets distributed or a separate library that has versioning or you know, uh, ABI management, um, so numbers and that sort of thing. Um, because it, it becomes more clear over time that the model for which a lot of our policy was designed is the model that's espoused by C and languages like it. And there's an awful lot of stuff people want to run on computers today, particularly in you know web application space, that doesn't really quite work like that. And uh, so I don't know. I don't know what I think. The, the problem is, I think my personal history in Debian has been really sort of tied up in this notion that things evolved on their own. And because amongst our community, there were enough smart people, when we reached some point where there had to be an inflection, there had to be a change, somebody was smart enough to stick their hand up and go, we gotta do something different. And we were all willing to sort of listen, argue out the boundary conditions and actually change things and go do something differently. And uh, whether that was A out to ELF, or whether it was, I don't know, moving from the whole FSS TND to the FSG file system hierarchy standard. Hey, there's been a lot of times that we've had to do things and we figured out how to make those transitions. And the fact that the system basically kept working for users through those transitions is the kind of thing that I think was really important and I hope we don't screw up. Yeah, um, actually Gunnar, you've been there a while. Yeah, well, uh, I was uh, thinking throughout the, the presentation, well, what amazes me most that I have seen, I've been uh, almost 15 years in the project, and, uh, well, the, the social transition is uh, something that uh, I would uh, really highlight for, for this period that uh, starts basically when you finish your presentation. That's a uh, recorded history starts more or less when I join. That's, uh, well, <laughs> nice. So uh, you can write those chapters. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 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 the thing is, yeah, when I joined, uh, I knew, I was aware, everybody knew that getting into Debian was getting into a fighting boys club, uh, having a, a high testosterone levels, and well, having a, a, a fixed skin was uh, expected and was required, everybody knew about it. And well, we, we made a huge transition into a project where we explicitly have to be excellent to each other, where we have to include everybody, where, uh, and, and it's, uh, well, at least uh, I don't feel that it feels uh, artificially, politically correct, like in many cases it happens. So I understand that's natural from growing up. I, uh, most of the people I knew that were 20 something back then, well, were around the 40s by now, and yeah, there are, uh, 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 they were and they are, and they will be younger and older people. Uh, I, I am very happy, I, I started like uh, counting uh, generations now, and yeah, there, there, there is still, it, it's not like we are all getting older, we're, we are getting new, new people joining, uh, younger people joining, contrary to, to what some of us have talked about in the past. But well, this, uh, this uh, strong shift of uh, attitude, I think it's uh, well, the, the only thing that allows us to, to continue functioning as a, as a, as a group to, into the future. I totally agree, and I think it's been really, really important, and I have loved being part of this community as we sort of evolved in that way. The only thing I'd throw out there, um, I unfortunately wasn't in Enrico's talk, I guess on Sunday was the one where you talked about the importance of the social relationship we have versus technical things or something. I hadn't arrived yet. I, I came in, are you laughing? I came in, <coughs> I came in later that night um, and the, the one reaction I had to the report that someone gave me of that talk was, I think it's really important that we all remember that it's really important to be excellent to each other, but being excellent to each other doesn't mean not disagreeing with each other. It doesn't mean holding back when we think there is something that's true that's not part of the conversation. And what I mean by that is that I think, personally, that embracing diversity requires that we actually know what other people think, and that we trade ideas, and that we have disagreements that we, in a 
a collaborative sort of convivial way talk to each other about how we feel and what's different between your opinion of, of how the world should work and mine and what that means and how that translates into Debian. And only when we're actually open and communicative with each other are we actually embracing that diversity. Uh, otherwise, we're kind of don't ask, don't tell, and that's not a good way to live. Um, having said all of that, I think one of the key things that we really have to stay focused on is that we are an association of individuals who have made common cause to create a free operating system. The reason we're here, the reason we come to DevConf is to help make Debian the technical deliverable as great as it can possibly be. There are all sorts of things that happen along the way. I have so many friends here. I love coming to DevConf because I get to see all my friends in person again. But the reason it's important that we're friends is that when we have built those sorts of interpersonal relationships, it allows us to work more effectively the rest of the year online through the internet and other crappy communications tools um, to very effectively deliver an outstanding technical result. And so, we should do all the things to be open and inclusive, but we should also always remember what the point of doing that is and what we're trying to accomplish at the end of the day. Yeah, Neil. So, you talked about the core documents, you talked about the stage the internet was at at that point and how small everything was. How, how do we extend those core documents to actually consider users who are a step away from Debian. They don't even know they're running Debian, they're just using a website. And that website might be running on Debian, might be running on Windows. They don't know and possibly they don't even care. So how do we embrace that? How do we allow ourselves to, to offer, offer the best service when we are dealing with software as a service? We are that far away from the users. We, are, we have problems at the moment where it's very hard to judge uh, that kind of software because we don't have any idea how many users there really are. We just see a couple of installations, but then there's hundreds of thousands of users per, per instance. And then you've got all these other boxes where it might be a container, it might be just something ephemeral, it's gone away, maybe it comes back as a different OS. Uh, as far as the users are concerned, they've got no idea. How do we uh, protect those users? How do we communicate with those users? And what do we need to change? to give them a better service? Well, it's sort of interesting that you asked this, and I'm glad you sort of filled in a few details about the kinds of things you're thinking about, because I was immediately going to throw it back at you and say, what do you think we're missing? And so thank you for talking a little bit about the software as a service case and the indirection of the relationship with our users that results from that. I don't think there's like a really simple answer to this. Um, one of the things that I think is important is um, really sort of being willing to think about other use cases that are brought to us that we don't intrinsically use ourselves. Um, it's funny, in, the, in building rocket avionics stuff with Keith, um, we try very hard to not build things we wouldn't use ourselves. Um, put differently, most of the stuff that we make and sell to other people in that hobby is stuff that we actually wanted ourselves. And that helps inform you know, things that are really cool. And it's certainly true, you know, to Tom's point earlier, you know, who are the users? Well, the users I've always cared about have been me and the people I know personally, right? Um, my wife's a graphic designer, my kids are off doing their own cool things in technical and social policy arenas that are you know, outside of my personal real direct experience. And yet I want to make sure that they're all taken well care of. I guess on some level we have to assume that some amount of proxying will happen on behalf of the people that are standing up those sorts of services on behalf of what they care about for their users. Certainly, if somebody here has a great idea, lovely. If there are people that we should invite to come help us figure out how to do these things better, then let's figure out who they are and, and invite them. Um, but from my perspective, it is interesting. In listening to Matthew Garrett's talk, the first one, not the second, and the, the non-security one, um, one of the things that I sort of, in the middle of it, had as a, a gut reaction was, who died and left us responsible for all of these problems? Um, because on some level, it's like, okay, there are a lot of things that ought to be done better. And, you know, as others tried to point out this week, maybe we are 
the people with the positional authority and the gravitas to actually go drive some changes. But in this particular case, I don't know that sort of solving all the problems of you know, how software as a thing that's consumed itself versus a software-enabled service that's the thing that's consumed itself, I don't know that that's completely within the scope of our ability to, to, to do something good about. Our scope, of my, as from my perspective, is that there are themes that are pr principles that are um, rules within Debian that are getting in the way of actually del delivering those kinds of services because of the things like the faster release cycles. So there are lots of ideas about how do you actually maintain these kind of web services when, yes, you want an open core, but actually you want the top level to be updated much more rapidly for the security fixes and everything else that happens. The web is so risky. Um, so it, on the one hand, you've got this, yes, everybody uses the web because it's um, ubiquitous now, but it's also a security nightmare. <coughs> yeah. And you've got to keep on top of those things so quickly. How would we manage to keep um, what we think of as a release, as one big object, able to support these kinds of services where we've already got a few exceptions and say, well, oh, this package needs to go through uh, quicker than it would normally go or into the last stages of the release or get updates during point releases just because of the security implications and it's a brand so, so let me ask a question. How many of the people in the room run Debian stable on anything other than a server? What do you do? <laughs> what do you do with stable on something other than the server? Use it. Use it everywhere. You probably still. Desktop. It's 2017. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so, so already you can see. So. Hmm? I forgot. This is stable. That's stable too. Wow. Okay. What be next? I'm impressed. I don't. I. I couldn't do that. Um, <laughs> most of those people are going to be using back, uh, backboards to get. I, I, as I say, I, I, I run unstable with bits of experimental and an yeah. upstream kernel that I build myself, and everybody around me runs testing. Um, and uh, I, I think Keith jokingly once called stable stale and unstable usable. Um, <laughs> and I don't know how joking that really is, because that's certainly the way I use them. Um, I, will have to, I have to admit that personally, it's always bothered me that we put so much emphasis on the stable release process. I really, really care about the improvement thresholds that we demand in order to allow packages to promote from unstable into testing. The fact that we don't let things sort of get out of unstable unless they meet, you know, some sort of obvious structural requirements and aren't adding new heinous bugs and all that sort of thing. But um, it's interesting because somehow it, it seems like so much of the rest of the world looks at us and thinks of us as like the original enterprise distribution with an enterprise distribution-esque release cycle. And I think of this as the distro that releases, what's it now, four times a day? <laughs> um, you know, every time the, the, uh, the unstable packages files are updated. So uh, that's a really interesting question. I have no huge insights here because I have, you know, my professional career, a lot of that was helping people understand how they could sort of pick the level of intensity of change they were willing to deal with. Um, and, you know, we built some products that were built on stable with some strange stuff bolted in that went to a gazillion places and at one point were touching one third of all mobile phone calls in the world every day. And in another context, and, and by the way, those machines had to have like many nines of reliability because they were not going to be rebooted for like five years. Um, boy, that's a weird thing to think about. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, you know, helping people understand how to grab the latest, greatest bits and try to aggregate them to create something that would support their needs and expectations higher up the stack. And I always thought it was hugely challenging. It's interesting how rarely the discussion of what the stable release was actually came into the conversation. So I wonder sometimes if we just need to rethink all of that a little bit. Part of the conversation that we had in 1998 that led to the creation of package pools was my assertion that many users would actually want to have this thing that was somewhere between unstable and stable. 
And because it was implemented by Anthony Towns in support of the stable release process, that middle thing became called testing, which doesn't really sound like the most attractive thing to an end user. But if you go back and read that email thread from 1998, which I actually did like the night before last, um, I was making the point back then that I thought that was what most people would actually probably want to be running. And this leads, leads to this interesting situation where I want to push back on some of the fundamental assumptions about, oh, Debian releases really slowly and we have to be bound by that as fundamental assumptions in that whole discussion. I don't know that that leads us somewhere terribly useful. And I certainly don't want anybody involved in the stable release process to feel like I don't appreciate them because my servers run stable and I really like them being really, really stable. But it's interesting that I think this is another place where many of us within the Debian community maybe have very different ideas about what's really important and I don't know that we've ever really had a great overt conversation about it. I, I don't know if that helps or not. I, I, you know, I don't have immense wisdom. It was, it was, I was trying to get the, the your perspective on how things like maybe our view of users in sort of uh, contract has to change, or maybe the DFSG needs to have some idea of this separation. So I don't think the DFSG ought to be touched for this, because I, it, unless somebody has a specific suggestion that we can think about, because I still believe that the fundamental assertion of core values is pretty much the right one. Now, how we translate that into deliverables is a place where I think we can have some discussion. I've heard some ideas floating around this week about how maybe we think about DFSG compliance a little bit differently than we have in the past, particularly with respect to the difference between binaries and sources. I hope there's a robust discussion about some of the challenges we face and how some tweaks and how we think about those and process the software that we package, um, you know, might lead us to a better state. But I don't have a whole lot of, I don't have much to inject there. Yeah. Our friendly camera operator in the back uh, wonders if you have any insight on uh, how Debian was used at Pixar. In the how beginning. Debian was used at Pixar. Uh, I know much more about how it was used at DreamWorks because they were one of my customers. Um, at, at DreamWorks, it was um, well. Okay, there's hmm, what can I actually talk about? <laughs> uh, I do know that there are multiple rendering farms run by different digital content creators where large clusters of servers are running Debian as the base OS for the rendering of the final product. I don't think I can mention which companies are using what. Uh, there's one well-known company that has been involved with Debian in the past that's a very conspicuous Red Hat user. But yeah. There are also many Debian people working at Red Hat who run Debian on their own laptops. So, so that's an interesting little factoid on when RPM first emerged and Red Hat was first getting started. There were multiple conversation amongst conversations between key folks in different parts of Debian and some of the founders of Red Hat about wouldn't it be neat if what Red Hat did was use Debian as its base and then sort of build its thing on top of it. And uh, unfortunately, I think they've become too invested in the idea that RPM was a thing that they could sort of attach stickiness to from a business standpoint for that to have ever actually worked. But um, boy, wouldn't the Linux standard space problem have been really different if just everybody used Debian as their base? But, oh well. Yeah, son? So I just wanted to come back to your comparison of stable and unstable. And you said, well, we release four times a day or whatever. Right. I think that's not kind of true, because we release um, four times a day, 75% of the time. And like the other quarter of the time, we're in freeze. Oh, and unstable is doing very little. <laughs> so it's like there, there is a tension there between the needs of a distribution that has a process of stable releases. Yeah. yeah and the needs of um, a kind of rolling release model. Yeah, there are probably people in the room that feel, still feel hurt by some of my vitriol over the years about you know, how horrible long freezes are to the project as a whole, because the idea that I can't un upload something to unstable when I want to has always just sort of driven me nuts. Um, having said that, this is where I think, you know, to some extent, I think a lot of the 
Freeze delays has had to do with how we think about our deal with these really large, complex, interacting suites of stuff. And the funny part is, I don't really use any of those. And so it does cause me sometimes <coughs> to wonder whether that question, which was first being asked in like March of 96 and has come up a number of times since, about, you know, should we really be thinking differently about some core set of things and some non-core set of things it keeps coming up. And I keep trying to not have a different answer because I really hate the idea of sort of separating it into first class and second class software somehow. And yet, um, I don't think any of us in the beginning, even, even when I, thank you, even when I used to joke about the fact that uh, at the rate we were packaging things, eventually all software would be packaged for Debian, uh, even when I was saying that, you know, 12, 13 years ago, um, I don't think any of us ever anticipated that we would have as many packages with as many lines of source code in the archive as we do today. And in the past, every time we've hit crazy scaling boundaries, we've been willing to step back and say, okay, what do we have to do to get past this? The new maintainer process, you know, putting that in place was one of those. Um, becoming more formal in the way we communicate and sort of inoculate incoming people with, you know, the virus of our um, core values is another one. You know, maybe it's time for us to have that conversation, not to figure out how to fracture the archive, but how to think about this. Are there ways we can package and integrate stuff that doesn't cause as many of these crazy transition hassles as we seem to have stumbled through in the last couple of release cycles? I would love for a stable release to be much faster process. I'd love for there to be more automation in the promotion of packages. What we have now seems really good, and yet it's interesting that at the scale and at the complexity we've gotten to, it still seems like our release managers go nuts in massaging those, you know, hints files to get everything to work. Something that um, might make like a split more palatable is if we are thinking like not in terms of the core and the bits we don't care about, so like the um, Ubuntu main universe thing, but instead the bits that make sense to freeze yes. and the bits that move fast. We've that certainly experimented like that. Less yeah. pleasant way to think of it. Yeah, that's a good point. And we've experimented with that. The whole volatile thing was sort of one thought about that, but we tried very hard to sort of minimize the amount of stuff that was in volatile things like virus scanner rules files and stuff like that. And I think there's a I think there's a, a fertile opportunity here for people to think about, propose, and begin discussion on you know ways that we could change the way we do things. Um, it was really interesting sitting in uh, Joey Hess's talk about you know, leaving Debian the other day, uh, I was struck by the fact that uh, something he said sort of resonated, and other people seem to have talked about it too, that somehow Debian was sort of too big to change, and, or that it was hard to get big things to change, or hard to get big changes implemented, or something like that. I, just, I guess I just reject that on the face, because <clears throat> um, we've never been afraid to change things. We just have been afraid sometimes to open the discussion about changing something because we didn't want to deal with the flame war. And you know, maybe that's the same thing on some level. We don't but... have flame wars anymore, so maybe now's the right time. Oh, cool, oh, cool. <laughs> I unsubscribed from so many lists, I don't know what they're like anymore. <laughs> Famously, when I was running for DPL, I was subscribed to all the mailing lists, and everybody in the project Whoa. knew that because I sent a resubscribe message to all of them to make sure I was, and it went to the list, not to the list. <laughs> I guess the name awareness that came from that going in everybody's inboxes helped me get elected. I don't know. <coughs> um, yeah, ways to screw up and become DPL. Uh, really good point. I don't know what the answer is, but uh, that seems like an interesting way to do it. We have about five minutes left, so let's move and get a couple more questions. Yeah, and I guess we should wrap up. I be thinking when we're talking about testing and everything. Um, one of the things the cool new hipster distributions do out there is have something that they release every day and then call it rolling, um, which sounds familiar, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you can say that Arch Linux is a bit more extreme than that, um, but I think maybe we should just rename testing as rolling and then say this is what we've been doing for years. Yeah, so. I don't know. What, what's in the name? Yeah, but. Rose by any other name still stinks. Um, 
Yeah, but I mean, essentially, the, the thing is, we've been doing the same thing as some of the more recent yeah. distributions are doing. So that's my point, really. Uh, and, and yes. Essentially, it's not, it's not that strange, really. Well, so I, I've tried suggesting a couple times that we could even have sort of multiple dynamic flavors that are somewhere between unstable and a real stable release. And every time I say this, the archive managers cringe because even though theoretically having a package pool means that you never have sort of more than the number of versions of any given thing that are referenced from different places at one time, adding another sort of list of references has the potential of you know, increasing the size of the archive significantly. And so they cringe every time I suggest this, but um, I've wondered, you know, um, Andreas probably remembers, we've had lots of discussions over the years about how we should be crafting flavors of Debian, you know, which have been through many different names over time, custom Debian distributions, whatever. And I keep wondering if there's an, op an opportunity for creating more dynamic subsets of the whole distribution where we aren't calving things on the basis of you know, uh, core versus not, but more on the basis of this is what actually matters to somebody who wants to work in this particular problem to me. Maybe a medically oriented distribution and a ham radio, or, you know, maybe we could actually do Linux for hams. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it hadn't been installed, you know, and Keith and I talked for a while about something we are going to call baked, BDL and Keith's excellent desktop. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, with all the connotations. And, yeah, we just never got around to it. But this notion of uh, somehow creating lighter weight subset distributions that could have dynamic, more dynamic properties than a full stable release. I'm not suggesting that for realsies today. I'm not going to back it up with a write up or anything. But those are the kinds of ways of maybe changing how we think about the process that I think we ought to all be engaging in and talking about in order to be able to scale. Enrico, I, the name change, you know, propose it and we'll see if it makes sense. <laughs> Enrico. You mentioned long uh, flavors. What do you remember of such? I'm sorry? Uh, you mentioned long uh, flavors. Yeah. What do you remember of, if I remember correctly, <coughs> such? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot to remember. Yeah. <coughs> How long did that release process take? Three years. Yeah, and the, uh, the freeze period was like six or eight months or something? No, it was over, like, over a year. Over a year. I think I was sufficiently distracted by other things going on in my life that I did not quite get to the point of sticking a gun to my temple and pulling the trigger. But, man, um, it's interesting. When we started talking about this idea of doing timed releases, um, there's pros and cons. And one of the things we've always said is that a distinguishing feature of Debian is we'll, we'll release when we're ready. But I've also personally been one of those people for whom, without the 11th hour, nothing ever gets done. And there's something to be said for, you know, sort of putting milestones in the sand and saying, okay, we're going to target this, we're going to target this, so that you get people to coalesce their activity to all occur in, you know, sort of a finite period of time. I keep wondering if there aren't yet more ways we can improve the coalescing of energy around our release time so that the, those processes could be shorter. I don't know if that's useful or not. Um, we could also just not change as much software and the release processes would be easier, but who would want that, right? I don't know. Um, I hope that this meandering through some of the early history of the project has maybe helped provide a little context about where we came from and what some folks care about. I know that in the last year, uh, the loss of Ian Murdoch, our, our project founder, based on conversations I've had this week, that different people have been emotionally affected by that, more or less. Uh, as one of the people who had the opportunity to interact with him quite a bit directly via email and in person back in the early days of the project, um, yeah, uh, hearing about that right at the time other things were changing in my life certainly didn't help my mood for a while. But I think it's really important for us to remember that he helped sort of set us up for an immense amount of success. And since he had not directly been involved in the project since, you know, sometime in 1996, um, the reason Debian is what it is today is because of all of us. And I know because he told me a bunch of times over the years that he was immensely proud of what we had accomplished and would certainly hope we would keep figuring out how to collaborate excellently with each other 
uh, to keep this Debian thing going for a long time in the future. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Enjoy the rest of the conference.